Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Daniel Davis Deep Dive Intel Brief, where the weekly wrap-up, we show you what some of the best things that we uh, showed you and revealed during the week, uh, because I know everybody can't see everything, so we want to make sure you don't miss the most important stuff during the week. So we're just going to jump right into it this week. Uh, one of the common themes that we had throughout the week was the the presence. I, I think it may have been uh, at some one point or another covered every day, and that is the BRICS Summit. Uh, this this emerging um, economic uh, and diplomatic bloc but, uh, that's headlined by Russia and China and has India and uh, South Africa and, and quite a number of other uh, countries now spreading quite a bit larger uh, than it was. Their 16th summit, but this was kind of a big one. One of the main reasons was because that they are now actively pushing, uh, creating an alternative payment system to global trade, to the dollar, to the SWIFT system, et cetera. And, and over time, most of the experts that we put on the channel this week said that it's going to continue to erode at the centrality of the dollar, and that could have unpredictable consequences for U.S. Uh, economy going forward. Uh, one of the other interesting things that uh, that I think that is is emerging, and in this uh, this next clip here is going to show, is is this also a change of mentality, or, or perhaps even better said, it exposes. A, a different concept of the world and even a different recognition of what's true and what's not. Now, I, I want to show you here this, uh, first of all, a, a, a bit of a conference that uh, Putin held at the end uh, to where there was international media there, and they actually accredited Western media, which they knew were going to be hostile ahead of time. So that was I, I, a little bit eye-opening to me that they're willing to, to talk to Western reporters uh, directly addressing Vladimir Putin in this case. And what I want you to, the reason why we, we cut this one the way we did is I want you to see the BBC reporter, how he views things and how he sets up the content. And then you'll see Putin's answer. And, and I, as you watch this, I want you to bear in mind the uh, disdain with which the BBC reporter is going to talk about Putin and he's going to claim a double standard. But when you listen to Putin, tell me which side you think is the least connected to reality. So I asked him this, the BRICS summit of emerging nations, which Vladimir Putin has been hosting, um, issued a declaration calling for global security and stability and a just world. And I suggested to President Putin that none of that matched his actions over the last two and a half years since his decision to, to launch the full scale uh, invasion of Ukraine. I mean, where's the justice in that? In his answer, he turned everything round and accused the West. Here's a part of, of what he said to me. We told them, this NATO expansion, don't do it. It violates our security. Still, they did it. Is that just? There is no justice here, and we want to change that, and will achieve it. And, and of course, you know, we, we I, I think even as recently as yesterday's show, we showed you some comments by Putin where he's very matter-of-factly saying that they're going to continue on with this uh, what they call a special military operation until they have military success and they have accomplished their political objectives, uh, which is security of their state, which they have literally said from the beginning. But isn't it ironic that we want to lecture the Russian president, though the West does, the major media, and saying, hey, your actions don't say anything about somebody who wants peace or who wants negotiations. And then you look at things from the the bigger context. Let's go back 15 years actually it's now uh, closer to 16 or 17 years when uh, in the, uh, I think it was the January, well, I can't remember the month, but it was definitely 2008 Bucharest summit, the NATO summit that was in Bucharest, where we first openly declared that Ukraine and Georgia would be admitted into the alliance. Putin was very une unequivocal about saying, no, that that is something we're not going to tolerate. We're not going to allow the Western military alliance to come up to the very heart of, of the plateau and the plains that point straight to Moscow, where they have been invaded twice before in previous centuries from the West. Uh, he was not going to allow that, and he had just conti gave continual warnings year after year saying, no, we're not going to do it. In 2021, uh, the pressure started ramping up. Then and Putin started putting more troops around the border. And again, because the political movement was moving much more rapidly, uh, there were changes in the uh, Ukrainian constitution. They openly declared they were going to retake by force if necessary. Uh, the, the breakaway Republic of, Don, of Luhansk and Donetsk, the, the uh, Donbass area, uh, Russia said, don't do it. They continued up. And, and then finally, we know now because 
Jen Stoltenberg himself admitted it publicly earlier this year, saying that, yes, Putin said that if you put NATO into Ukraine, then there's we're, there's going to be conflict. We're going to use military force to prevent it. And we said, no, we dismissed it. And Putin had given his latest December of that year an alternative for peace, uh, an alternative negotiation that would have kept even uh, nominal control of even the Donbass uh, and all the rest of it in Kiev's control. All they were really looking for was a declaration of no NATO in Ukraine. The Russian side was and autonomy, a certain amount of autonomy for the Russian uh, ethnic speaking people in the eastern part of Ukraine. And had that been uh, accomplished, then there would have been no war. Putin said that privately. He said that publicly. And then we, as I, I've told you before, uh, according to a, a diplomatic source that I know here in Washington, D.C., uh, Putin told Biden that face to face at a, at a private meeting in June of 2021. Biden blew him off. And we see what happened here. So, but you see the mentality of the Western side is, well, none of that should matter because the words coming out of our mouth are, it's a defensive alliance. We don't have any hard will, will against anyone. We're not threatening anyone. That's what we say with our mouth. And then with our actions, we keep moving this uh, military alliance up to the very border uh, of the heartland of Russia. And as, as I keep saying over and over, and I'll say it again now, Nobody is going to allow that in the West. We would not permit under any circumstances, uh, either in like, say, Canada or in Mexico, uh, uh, Russia or a China making a military alliance with with either of those countries. We would never, ever tolerate it. Uh, and yet you, you just see completely blithely this reporter ignoring all of that and saying, well, you're not looking for peace, Vladimir Putin. You're just looking for more war. And then. Putin very clearly shares his point of view. And, and therein is one of the big problems is that we view things so radically different. The same set of facts are viewed so radically different is that they're irreconcilable. And from the Russian side, looking in the direction of the West, they think you're irrational. You're just not even looking at reality here. And then on the Western side, we say, what is wrong with those people? They don't see just common things. Of course, we're not going to invade them. Because and I think many most in the West actually believe that. But we the problem is, as I pointed out, we would never accept those actions. We just want them to accept the actions and then everything would be fine. And so as long as we have that different view, that different opinion, that basically the other side has no valid point of view and only we can say what is the right thing, then we're going to continue to have these problems and we're going to continue to be on the brink of war and of escalation into potentially nuclear war. I wish that that were limited only to this one theater of action. It would be more manageable. Unfortunately, in this next clip here, uh, we had John Mearsheimer on this week, and we were asking him about a similar situation, only this time related to uh, the Israel and Iran situation. And there are certainly many in the United States uh, that have just this unquenchable hatred for Iran, has since 1979 uh, during the revolution when the uh, Mullahs took over uh, and it has not stopped in the uh, in the intervening time. And all of this wars now that uh, Israel has launched itself into uh, haven't quenched that at all. But I asked uh, Professor Mearsheimer what he thought about the current situation and the risk of going after Iran. You can go in and maybe destroy their nuclear facilities if it's the Americans and the Israelis acting as a tag team. Maybe you can destroy all those existing nuclear facilities, but that's not going to prevent Iran from ultimately getting the bomb. And in fact, it's going to give Iran an incentive to get the bomb. The Iranians have not yet made a decision to get nuclear weapons, as best we can tell. We're quite confident of that. And I believe that if we were to hit those nuclear facilities with the Israelis, or even if the Israelis do it alone, they are very likely to decide they need nuclear weapons to deter a future attack of that sort. And if the Iranians get nuclear weapons, the Saudis have made it clear they're going to get nuclear weapons. And if the Saudis and the Iranians have nuclear weapons, you can rest assured that the Turks, the Iraqis, and the Egyptians are going to think long and hard about getting nuclear weapons of their own. And that proliferation process across the entire Middle East uh, is not uh, a situation that we want to see happen. Uh, but that's the consequence, I think, of going after their nuclear capabilities. 
And, and, you know, the problem is there are great many people and very influential people in the United States, or, or maybe a better way to put that is not really a great many, but certainly a great many influential people uh, certainly do want to see that outcome. And that really exposes uh, a complete lack of understanding of the consequences of actions. Okay, you hate Iran, you don't like them, you don't like what the Mullahs did, whatever. We, we can agree or disagree on that, but each person can have their own viewpoint on that. But what you can't do is just say, we don't like that outcome, so we're going to take this action to solve it if there's not a viable, rational path to where it has a chance to actually succeed. And therein is our huge, huge disconnect. And this is not just an issue with the Biden administration. Well, let's just jump back to the, I could go a lot further back, but we'll, we'll just go back to the Trump administration in 2019 uh, because Trump came into office really hating Obama, who in 2015 had uh, developed this JCPOA, the so-called nuclear agreement with Iran, which had put substantial curbs on any possibility that Iran would get a nuclear weapon. Now, this didn't make a lot of people uh, in, in Israel happy because they, they don't want to have a deal with Iran. They don't want to negotiate a settlement. They don't want Iran to exist. And so they continued to hype the threat a bit, and they convinced Trump when he got in office to just, just get rid of the, the, uh, the deal, which he did. So when uh, I believe it was in May of 2018, uh, he just unilaterally pulled the United States out of this very difficult uh, years-long negotiated process that we'd gotten into. And all of the constraints that we had on Iran— uh, inspectors at, at a number of locations, UN inspectors that were, uh, you know, were free to do a number of things. Not they didn't have total freedom, so there were some you know, constraints and limitations on them. But it was expansive; it was substantial intrusion into the internal workings inside of these facilities in in, uh, in Iran. And they have very sensitive equipment that can pick it up, even from places not where they were physically located. Uh, then you also had physical constraints on how much uh, nuclear material they could have. They could do some for research, but very small quantities and in very low grade. I, I want to say it was like 5%, I think, initially uh, 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 refined product, whereas you have to have 90% refined to, to have produced nuclear grade, et cetera. Well, with those constraints taken off, Iran started building up. Uh, initially, I think to put pressure on the United States to go back into the deal because part of the process was if Iran complied with the uh, specific requirements of that deal, that some of the uh, uh, economic sanctions would be taken off of them. So, of course, when Trump comes in, he puts all the sanctions back on them, and I think even loads a few more on top of it. So now then uh, Iran no longer has any motivation uh, to abide by the agreement, even though the Europeans who hated what the U.S. did, did everything in their power to keep the deal alive. But since Iran wasn't getting any of the benefits that were promised them, of course, they slowly started shedding off their constraints. And now to this day, I think it's there. They have a substantial amount of nuclear material reprocessed. They're they're uh, uh, producing, I think, up to like 80 percent just below weapons grade. And to not much difference to make it go there, according to the CIA. Recent studies is that Iran still has not made a decision to go to a nuclear bomb. They don't they haven't moved to that last phase to turn it, the material into nuclear weapons grade material to actually build a bomb, but that the breakout time has now sque squeezed down to possibly less than a month. So meaning from the time that a decision is made, they could have an official material for at least one or three nuclear bombs within about a month. Now, there's still other processes where it would be necessary to get it uh, uh, weaponized and put on warheads and that were deliverable, et cetera. That would still take quite a bit longer. But the, the bottom line is they could get it relatively rapidly. So we are now in a position to where we are providing the very incentive that Iran needs to go across that threshold that we claim that we want to avoid. And there's not a, a bigger cheerleader in this than, than Lindsey Graham. And, and I want to show you real quick something that he said uh, uh, last December uh, about it was part of the uh, Israeli war it got, at that time against Hamas, and they were they were already getting some shots across the bow from uh, from the Hezbollah, and he had had enough of this, and so he went on Fox News and well, watch this. Without Iran, there are no Houthis. The Houthis are completely backed by Iran. I've been saying for six months now, hit Iran. They have oil fields out in the open. They have the um, Revolutionary Guard headquarters you can see from space. Blow it off the map.
yeah, just blow it off the map. Don't even worry about any consequences, anything else. That's another one of the traits that, that you're going to start seeing a lot more of. We don't give any thought to what happens with our actions. So, okay, Trump had these actions in 2018, and they had consequences. We we had a deal in place. We had constraints in place. We took off our part, and they naturally, without the constraints, went back up into producing more material and more highly enriched material. So everything in the direction of shortening the window when they could get a bomb. So that's where we're up to that point. Now, Lindsey Graham is saying, just go ahead and bomb them. Just knock this stuff out. Like, that's all you got to do. See, he's thinking like something like what happened in Syria uh, under, uh, I think, even the Obama administration, the Trump administration, and, and the Biden administration. They've all had various times where they've launched missiles of various types for various alleged reasons into Syria. Syria is powerless to do anything about it, so there were never any consequences. Just whatever we wanted to do, we did. Or, or Obama's uh, infamous uh, attack in 2011 when he went after Omar Gaddafi in Libya, uh, thinking that that's not going to have any consequences. Well, we, we took him out, as, as uh, Hillary Clinton most infamously once said. We came, we saw, he died. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, you know, she really laughed a lot about that, yucked it up on television, uh, patted themselves on the back. But now what has happened to the, to the country of Libya and all their people since that time? They're in abject poverty to this day. There is complete and total chaos in the country. There are still two competing governments that claim legitimacy uh, and those things, you know, they, they can't get those things solved. So there's still constant friction and potential violence there all because we took an action and we just didn't care about the consequences. This one could be a lot worse. And now then, uh, as this war has continued on, because Israel is also oblivious to the consequences or maybe they do want them. That's a separate uh, argument for another day. But in, in April of this year, there was a situation to where uh, Iran, Israel destroyed an embassy compound in Syria of the Iranians, which was one of the most highly uh, provocative acts any nation could ever take. And of course, Iran responded, but they did so very measured. We've talked about that many times where they had 350 uh, projectiles of various types, uh, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles and, and drones. But they did so in a way that they wanted most of them to get shot down. They used a bunch of their older stuff. But who knows, up to half of it didn't even function properly, et cetera. Nobody was killed. But that didn't deter uh, Lindsey Graham. And so he went in a, in a, uh, a committee meeting in the U.S. Senate uh, and had this really angry exchange with the uh, administration officials. Would you have supported dropping the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, General Brown, to end World War II? Well, Senator, I think it's based on the situation where they... Well, we know. I mean, it's happened. We know. <laughs> I'm not asking. that They did it. Do you think that was disproportionate? It, it was uh, It was definitely... Uh, well, what do, you, do you, in hindsight, do you think that was the right decision for America to drop two atomic bombs on the Japanese cities in question? Well, I'll tell you, it stopped the World War. Okay, so Israel's been hit in the last few weeks by Iran, Hezbollah, and Hamas dedicated to their destruction. And you're telling me you're going to tell them how to fight the war and what they can and can't use when everybody around them wants to kill all the Jews? And you're telling me that if we withhold weapons in this fight, the existential fight for the life of the Jewish state, it won't send the wrong signal? So, first of all, he he's does what so many in America do completely obviates and, and ignores everything that Israel did that precipitated a lot of these actions. I mean, you can go all the way back to October 7th. Most people in the West act like that came out of nowhere and there was no reason for it at all. There's no antecedent at all. And even though I will still to this day say that the actions that Hamas took uh, were illegal and authorized and immoral there, they weren't without some kind of precedence because 200 and I think 223 was the exact number of Palestinians were killed in both the West Bank and the Gaza Strip by the IDF in the months preceding that because of lots of violence that was being perpetrated against the people on top of the decades that came before it. And of course, in this case, all the stuff leading up to both the, the strike in, in April uh, and now then the, the, the on October 1st strike from Iran, again, very measured uh, landing on basically an open area or going to military targets only. No cities were attacked at all, uh, and nobody was killed in any of these strikes.
because Iran doesn't want a war and they don't want it to escalate. But as we know, uh, according to some leaked documents that came out also this past week, uh, we are observing a substantial preparation by Israel to potentially do something within days. It's very, quite possible that we ins uh, insisted that they delay until after the election on November 5th. We'll see if that works out or not. But something as big is coming. But that's also not stopping many in the United States from pushing forward advocating that Israel not restrain itself, that it goes hard after Iran. I mean, just in, in recent days, we've had, uh, uh, let's see, we're, uh, we're about to go, John Bolton, Mike Pompeo, General Keene, General Kellogg, and of course, Lindsey Graham. And so that whole strata of, of influential people are still saying, yes, hit Iran, hit them hard, hit the nuclear facilities, take out their leadership, hit the IRGC, hit the oil facilities, et cetera, all these different targets, there's just this lust to go after. None of them are coherent about what comes next. And what do you suppose, Mr. Bolton, what do you suppose, General Keene, happens after if they take your advice, the Israelis do, and they actually cause significant damage to, to some of these uh, oil refineries or to the, to the uh, uh, nuclear facilities that we know where they have? What do you think is going to happen? You think, number one, there's not going to be any fallout, like like literal fallout, nuclear fallout. What about our troops in the area? Do, do you understand that? I mean, Gary often shows that map, and we got dots all over the Middle East. And you want to go and, and have a situation where there could be physical nuclear fallout uh, contaminating our own troops or our allies? Yeah, that's the one that, that thanks, Gary. I mean, you see, we, we it's not even just our troops alone, but we have allies all over this region. And you're going to potentially have these you know, nuclear contaminated clouds going over their territory. I mean, what, why do we think that there's no problem with that? Why do we think that no one's going to have a problem with nuclear fallout drifting over their country? So that's I mean, that's one of the first and most major. But then there's, of course, a military response. There are consequences to actions. And uh, Iran has been very clear that they have, well, okay, see, so Gary's on top of it again there. You see, that's, uh, I think that's as of today. They are saying that there could be up to a thousand missiles, not 200, not targeting things that we know that you're looking at or things that are just military, but something that you can't defend against because most of these missiles would almost certainly be preceded probably by a lot of drones to soak up a lot of the uh, interceptor missiles, which they would have to launch. And then once a lot of that was saturated, it would be followed with potentially pinpoint cruise missile strikes or ballistic missile strikes, which uh, really, even with the that system, uh, is unlikely to knock many of them down. So it could be catastrophic. And, and, and in this case, unlike the last two retaliations from Iran, these would probably be designed to cause casualties and pain on the Israeli side. And of course, you know, once that happened, as we, we showed you a clip of uh, former Secretary of Defense Cohen earlier this week, he claims that if that happens, then, of course, the U.S. is right away sucked into the war. Do these people not think about that? Does the, do the Boltons, the Pompeos, the Keens, the Kelloggs, the Lindsey Grahams, and, and you can just keep going down the list. There's no shortage of them. There's plenty of people that are out there. Why does no one think about what comes next or that there are ever consequences to action? And why is nobody given any thought to the potential for diplomacy? I think the reason is because we don't want diplomacy. We don't want to live with Iran. We don't want to live with anyone we don't like. We just want them to either be turned into docile slaves or subservient and just do, and having no agency and just doing what they're told and be quiet or, or to have them all killed. That's that based on our actions apparently is the the options that we want to live with. So diplomacy apparently isn't going to be uh, discussed. Uh, then we then let's move to uh, Colonel Jacques Beau, uh, one of our favorites. We love to have him on here. Uh, and, and he wants to point out to a different issue, not not so much uh, any of the foreign policy processes themselves, but from the American leaders. And he was he was given voice to something we heard several times this week by some of our guests. Uh, a real frustration around the world at what are the American leaders even thinking? The numbers of casualties have been, civilian casualties have been far too high. Uh, we'd like to see, um, you know, Israel scale back on some of the strikes that it's taking, in it, uh, especially in and around Beirut. Uh, and we'd like to see things transition to uh, some, some sort of negotiation that would allow uh, civilians on both sides of the border uh, to return to their, to their homes.
That's the point that I'll continue to make with uh, Minister Gallant. And I think, uh, yes, he does, he does take on uh, my, uh, my input. <laughs> does he, though? Does he take on his input? That's exactly the problem. The, he is powerless. And we see a very similar thing with Ukraine currently. And that's, that's a little bit worrying because you had, I mean, the U.S. had this ability to have some kind of control over the situation around the world. But today it's no longer the case. That means that they just launch crisis, but they're not able, the U.S. is not able to master this crisis after a while. And they are not able to, to manage them and to control them, to keep them down when, when necessary. And look, this, this, is, this is something pervasive. We, we, we started that segment off there with a, a comment from uh, Secretary of, of Defense Austin, but there was no shortage of other people we could have had in there too, because we keep saying, yes, we're very stern. And I'm talking about from President Biden on down. We keep saying yes to, for example, to, to Israel. We tell Netanyahu, we, we really want you to do this. We want you to listen to this. And then they don't. And, and very oftentimes, uh, they don't even hide their contempt. They just say, nope, not going to do it. I've, I've uh, shown you something in the past where Netanyahu himself came on Fox News uh, and just utterly repudiated what the president of the United States had just said, said, nope, it's not accurate at all. Oblivious to the fact that that's humiliating for Biden, but uh, illustrative of the fact that we have no agency here. And then you have many in the, in the, uh, the Trump world and Trump uh, circle of people that seem to be eager to get back into power to do more of what Bibi Netanyahu says, not somebody that's going to stand up and say, hey, here's what the American uh, interests are and here's where we're going to go. And American presidents have done this uh, from both parties plenty of times in the decades past. Our interests were paramount that, that we had friends around the world and uh, even allied uh, nations. But our, that's subordinate to our interests. We are supposed to have allies and friends around the world to the extent that it's beneficial to the United States. We're, we're, we're not a, a, a gift agency or a, a place that just hands out cash or whatever. We're in, in real world geopolitics saying, hey, our objective and our actually reason for existence, the U.S. government, is to keep safe the American people and to keep a safe environment at home and to keep uh, enemies abroad from, from doing anything against us or making sure we have the capacity to defeat anybody who does attack us and to uh, allow us to have the chance for freedom and economic prosperity. That's, that's in a nutshell what government is supposed to do. But what it's not supposed to do is say, we're going to take our resources and our personnel and our armed forces and we're going to hand them over to somebody else to use as they see fit. And we're going to get mad at anybody who says anything to the contrary. That sounds so absurd when you say it out loud. And yet that is exactly what we're doing on the ground. And you see it playing out right here. We, we have literally lost any ability to tell Netanyahu anything. And then we fund it and we enable it, uh, even though he's doing things that we ordinarily abjectly uh, uh, oppose and things that are in direct violations to the what we claim anyway is our values and morals as a country. We, we just ignore all of that and just continue to say, here you go. Here's the next shipment of bombs and missiles and, and rockets. Uh, it's, it's just unconscionable. And then you have these guys like Austin who stand up there and they want to say, you know, well, I, I think that the, you know, their secretary of defense has listened to us. Look, folks, when you've got to stand up there and give a press conference and, and try to convince the audience that, no, I think that he's going to listen to you. That, that shows for sure. He's not. And he isn't. And of course, the Secretary of State's the same way. The President of the United States currently is the same way. And unfortunately, I don't see a whole lot of that going to uh, likely to go away anytime soon. And of course, I can say the same, something near the same thing, not quite as strong in, in uh, the Russia Ukraine war, because uh, Zelensky should be told this, dude, this thing ain't going to work. There's no capacity for you to win. If we keep giving you, you know, shipments of, of all kinds of uh, bombs and ammunition and weapons, intelligence, all, all you're going to do is, is drag the war out a little bit longer and get more of your people killed. And the end settlement is, is going to be even worse. The longer you wait to have a negotiated settlement, the worse outcome you're going to get because Russia is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. That's the only thing that makes any sense at all. But Zelensky wants to keep fighting and he keeps making all these statements in public and he keeps going on all these tours around the world. 
and Western leaders from the president of the United States on down, uh, the new head of the NATO. We just keep saying we're keeping going with the fiction. Yep, it's inevitable that he's going to join NATO, providing Russia all the more motive and incentive to continue with their war until they have a military uh, outcome and just ignoring the ground truth realities. And we seem powerless at our senior leader level to do anything about it. We're like almost like an, a victim just being carried on down the, the r river, like, like you're in a, in a canoe or something on the white water, but you don't even have a paddle. You're just going down with the current and it takes you wherever it takes you. And one day or another, you're going to hit some rocks. And if you don't even have the capacity to steer the boat down this white waters, it's going to end somewhere bad for us. Um, and uh, I think that you can see some of that in, in uh, uh, Larry Johnson. We had him on toward the end of the week, and he was actually looking at things from the secretary of state level. With regard to uh, Minister Lavrov, uh, no, we didn't speak directly, but um, I was uh, in the room when he made his intervention on behalf of Russia. Uh, he was in the room when I made my intervention on behalf of the United States. So I think it's uh, safe to say that we uh, heard each other. I didn't hear anything new, unfortunately, about the ongoing Russian aggression against Ukraine. It's striking that so many countries that are half a world away in the Indo-Pacific care deeply about what's going on in, in Ukraine. And the reason, again, is because they know that if any country is allowed to act with impunity and to commit acts of aggression, that's a signal to would-be aggressors everywhere that it's open season. And that's going to be bad for everyone. In the last 40 years, you've had the United States. Hell, we'll go back 50 years. You got Vietnam. We got Cambodia. We got Panama, we got Libya, uh, we got Syria, we got Serbia, we got Somalia, we got Iraq, we got Afghanistan. But we've been going into those countries and killing their people without a declaration of war, in violation many times of UN resolutions. And so when people like Blinken sit there and try to moralize like this, in the wake of, it's not Russia that's got 750 military bases scattered around the world. It's us. And what good are we doing? Because at the end of the day, we rack up a body count of black, brown, and yellow people. And that doesn't exactly build goodwill towards the United States. And I think in the process of it, we've also bankrupted ourselves. And yet we persist with this mindset that we've got to rule the world. And, you know, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to bite us in the ass. It yeah. already is. That's exactly one of the, my concerns, which I was mentioning uh, on the earlier segments here. And, you know, it's ironic that you had Secretary Blinken in that sa uh, soundbite there talking about, how hey, I talk to people all over the world and they all care about what happens here. That, there, there's no truth to that, or at least not very much. I mean, of course, then I'd ask who he's talking to, because when other people talk to folks all around the world, they ask a very different question. Uh, we had John Mearsheimer on this week, and really before we came on the air, he and I were talking about a, a recent uh, uh, almost global whirlwind tour he took through quite a number of nations. And, and he said everywhere he went in the world, he said people are asking me the same questions that you and I are asking is, what is going on with America? What, what, what planet are they living on? Because what they say and, and the reality that everybody sees on the ground is rather different. And some of these people are not just talking to friends of mine, people that you know. They're also talking with their actions. We just saw, as you saw at the head of this, uh, this episode here, is this BRICS summit just came on. More and more people are following behind this vision of things and because uh, that is, conglomeration of all these now growing number of states to include nuclear power states, you know, behemoth economic power states, the, everything they talk about is about uh, economic advancement. They talk about win-win outcomes. They say, hey, join this here and you can benefit from it as well. They're, they don't talk about conquering anybody. They don't say the people we don't like, we're going to form a military wing and go after them. That's not even on their agenda. They're not even talking about this. There's no relations. There's no actions at all that they want to turn this into a military situation. People around the world see that. They, they see what Larry mentioned there about, hey, you've guys got 700 bases scattered on all four corners of the world. Why? Why do you guys need to have all this military out there when the, our alleged enemies don't?
I think I think there's a, a, a handful, uh, 15, 20, maybe not even that many for, for Russia, some in the Middle East, and it, it might not even be that high. And I want to say that, that China has like five or six five or six and they're they're all small there's none of these are big sprawling bases like what we've got all over the place none of them except uh i think russia may have one or two in syria that's that's about the extent of it we're at about 700 everywhere from small outposts all the way to these massive sprawling air bases uh spread literally throughout the world naval bases etc people are starting to see that people around the world and the center of gravity is shifting in, in a profound way and right now uh, the, it's, it's concerning and it's troubling, but pe- there's, con- there's problems about people work because they, they're no longer recognizing the United States as this, uh, defender of freedom of this stabilizing, f- uh, fact, uh, force that we have played really since world war II. And, and this, this figure that you can count on stability. You can, you can invest here and feel like your money is going to be safe. You can you can actually engage in in, in, uh, in economic activity and not be worried that one day that we're going to get sanctioned, or that the United States is going to sanction somebody else that you do business with, and now all of a sudden you're going to be faced with either losing business and not doing business with whomever we didn't like that day, or face penalties from the United States. And they don't want to be in that position. They want to be in the position which is what BRICS is actually saying. Hey, just join in here. We have, you know, these these uh, uh, constraints and and these fundamentals that allow for free trade, and they don't talk about sanctioning anyone. So at least, who knows? Maybe that changes in the future. But right now, it's not, and it's showing that large and growing numbers of people around the world are souring on the United States because they see our words and actions don't line up at all. But you know what? It's not just people around the world that see that dichotomy. It's also people right here in the United States. There is a, a, a new, uh, not new, I'm sorry, an, an accelerating problem in the United States of recruiting for our own armed forces. Now, I'm not the only one who sees this. Uh, there's a piece out in the Wall Street Journal, I think the, right now, uh, that's called DEI is Crushing Military Recruitment. That's, that's a little bit deceptive uh, because when, when you when you look into the, uh, the core of the article, uh, you see this uh, call that I've, I've mentioned here. It says, when asked to grade performance of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, veterans gave presidents a C minus. More than 80 percent of veterans who wouldn't recommend service cited a mistrust of political leadership as a major factors. Generals didn't fare much better receiving a C plus for their performance in recent wars. Look, our own population sees this. They see that our our, our politicians whether it's the president, secretary of state, secretary of, of uh, defense of, of either party, because I, I've shown you like uh, former secretary of state Pompeo is just saying ridiculous things, just uh, just nonsensical stuff that's disconnected from reality. Uh, and and, and uh, but presidents, you can go all the way back for well, really quite a while, as, as I think this one went back four presidents, these, this poll that was done in here that showed that there has been a dramatic drop of uh, people who had served in the military and would recommend it for their friends or family members. It has seen a 20 point drop uh, in, in just the last number of years. It's a, a dramatic drop. And the reasons why uh, DEI probably plays a part of it. Uh, it's it's lowering the standards, but see, they see the same thing I have been writing about and talking about since at least uh, 2010, which is that you have our generals lying to the American people. And look, I was one of the few that, while still in uniform, came out and, and quantified what that lying was when I came back uh, in late 2011 and published in 2012 an article that said, you're being lied to. You have all these senior generals and senior government officials i.e. politicians and generals that were telling you one thing, but they knew something else was true and we were failing in these areas here. You had the the, the Pentagon, I'm, I'm sorry, the Afghanistan papers that came out in the Washington Post in 2018 that provided even more justification for that. Again, a broad spectrum of military and government leaders who knew one thing and claim something different in public. So we know we've been lied to. So the trust in our country and in our government and in our senior leaders continues to fray. And and why would people who have actually been in the military, who don't have to worry about reports like mine, they see it with their own eyes when they do operations. They see how they're being treated. 
And then they're saying they're telling our, our uh, you know, the next generation, the rising generation, which has historically been the the really the bulwark of, of our recruitment capabilities. People who've been in the military used to, I think the number was 80 percent would recommend it to their uh, to their family members and friends. Now it's down to, I think, 62 and that, that's that's a precipitous drop coming in soon. And just people who aren't even associated with that are becoming more and more unlikely to join. And why should they not? When they see on, on the news, when they see on the social media, especially because they're trusting the news even less and less, it's not just the military and the government leaders, but also major media uh, trust is in the toilet. The Congress and the White House just really across the board. The levels of trust is just continuing to fall in the bottom. And that has specific, actual, tangible ramifications on our armed forces because fewer people want to join up. We keep trying new things. We try new marketing slogans. We try, you know, try to recruit them with, give them more money, more bonuses, et cetera. And, and it's just dwindling. It's just not working. In fact, the only one that's continuing to hit their numbers, relatively speaking, is the Marines who have the highest standards and then they haven't shaved any of their standards and they're still meeting their quotas. But the rest of the force just doesn't want to meet it because why is that? It's not because the, the Army and the Navy and the Air Force don't want to be successful. It's that the Army, Navy, Air Force and gen, uh, uh, forces generals want to get promoted. So because it's politically popular to do all this DEI stuff and and have all these, you know, quota of different uh, ethnic groups and all these different kinds of social groups, you know, quote, representation at given levels, uh, quota system. They see that people see that and they don't want to be a part of it. And so they're not joining up. And why do they want to join up when they see that they're being sent to Syria, to Iraq, to Jordan, uh, to the Red Sea to fight against somebody else who's not attacking the United States? I mean, why does anybody want to get a part of that? They, they talk about how we'll have a patriotic love for your country. Well, they do. Or many of them do. I certainly do. But I, I want to defend my country. I want to have a, a department of defense, not a, a department of offense. Not from a force that says, where can we use them today? Why are we in Syria? Why are we in Iraq still? Why are we in Jordan? Why are we in all those other places that Larry showed you, Gary showed you on that uh, on that map a minute ago? Why? What, what pressing national security need do we have? There's not one. I'll just tell you categorically. There's nothing that would threaten American national security that we couldn't r respond if we had our... Uh, forces on, on American naval bases, like every other country does. They have their forces primarily on their own, on their own forces or on their own shores and on their own land. Most countries do that. Even, even within NATO, the United States is one of the few that actually puts our troops and forces all over other NATO countries. Most of the other NATO countries just put them on their own. There's just handfuls that, that go from other ones. Why? Why do we do that? Because we want to have control over it. And, and I get why you would want that, why some people will say, no, I want more power and I want more flexibility and influenceability to be able to, to craft events. But as you saw uh, Colonel Bo talk about, it's not working. We're not controlling it. We can initiate things. We can't control them. And so we have people of, of progressively lower and lower uh, capacity in their roles, but with higher and higher political capacity so that they can get into these positions. But then they don't know how to make just common sense decisions. That was one of the other things Colonel Bo had said during the week. He goes, there's just not a lot of common sense decisions being made, which is an, an, an inextricable part of making good decisions and governing properly. So whether you're talking about overseas, whether you're talking about domestic, what we see is a continued deterioration of America's standing in the world, a deterioration in our ability to influence events. And even at home, the fabric is shredding on, on just American in general, not even just the military. That's the one particular uh, symptom is that it's, it's causing a problem for recruitment. But you see this acting across the country. Because these polls are talking about how there's deteriorating levels of trust in the government. Uh, in, in the military, in the, the media, uh, in the judiciary. I mean, you see it just going across the board. Things are getting shred because you have this elite that wants to try to create conditions that benefit them, and, and they're uh, uh, just impervious to ground truth reality. 
Instead of recognizing that the war in Ukraine can't be won, we continue going on with it. Instead of recognizing that the, uh, the, the, the Israelis have bit off more than they can chew, we ignore it and keep doing whatever we're told there. Instead of recognizing that there is no reason that we should get into any war against China in the Indo-Pacific on behalf of another country, i.e. Taiwan, we keep on giving them more and more arms, and we keep taking more and more actions that are provocative to the Chinese, i.e. going through the Taiwan Straits. So we keep taking all these actions that undercut our national security, that undercut the, the our ability to govern at home. And folks, there will be a consequence to this at some point, the tangible one. We, we, we saw a little bit of it in the Afghanistan debacle after two decades and we left, but that was relatively contained because there wasn't as much at stake there. But we keep this mentality going in these other areas. We could find ourselves in a big war that we should never have to fight and may not be able to win. And God help us if any of this goes nuclear. And, and I, I won't even get into the issues at home uh, because there's all kinds of uh, ramifications of that too. We'll, we'll have to do a separate show on that coming up soon, uh, which I probably will do, especially heading into this election here. You need to understand there's a lot more at stake than you may think. But that's our, that's our episode for today, folks. Uh, as, as always, uh, we are unintimidated and uncompromised. We're going to bring you the truth no matter what it is, even when it's hard. Because if you don't acknowledge the truth of a situation, it's hard to find solutions. And we're all about finding solutions and trying to prevent some of the worst outcomes. And, and until something happens, my optimism remains on that it is still possible. And we're going to do everything for you to bring that to light. Thank you very much. I uh, hope you have a great week. Uh, next week, uh, we've got uh, Doug McGregor back again. We've got Larry the Sure Johnson back again. Uh, and uh, some other folks, we're still trying to work some things out, but we'll always be covering the events as they break. Thanks very much. And we'll see you on the next episode of Daniel Davis Deep Dive.